Okay, we're also live on Facebook now. Dobry uh, den, good morning, and welcome to our online panel discussion on the parliamentary elections in the Czech Republic. The Czechs are going to cast a vote tomorrow and on Saturday, and those elections do not lack spectacular twists and turns. Can the revelation of uh, Pandora Papers influence the outcome? Um, what novelties, what new tendency can we see in this year's election? And what are the chances of forming a stable government and who will be in it? Those are some questions that we'll be discussing today. My name is Malvina Talik. I'm a research associate at the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe, short IDM. And I will be guiding you through today's discussion with our experts. And those are Aneta Zahova, Editor-in-Chief at Euractive Prague. Hello, Aneta. Uh, good morning, everybody. Petr Just, Head of the Department of Political Science and Anglophone Studies at the Metropolitan University Prague. Hello. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. And Daniel Martinek, Research Associate at IDM. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Marina, and good morning to everyone. Really nice to join you today for the discussion. Uh, thank you all for accepting our invitation. And also many thanks to our viewers for following this discussion. You can ask questions anytime and in chat or later on by raising your hand during the uh, Q&A uh, Q uh, session. Um, this uh, discussion, today's discussion, belongs to a long um, established series of events which uh, the IDM uh, co co organizes with uh, the Car Runner Institute and the Political Academy of the um, Austrian People's Party. And on behalf of the IDM, I would like to thank our cooperation partners for the successful collaboration. And at this point, I will hand over to Mr. Gerhard Mark, head of the Department for European uh, Politics at the Car Runner Institute to give us a welcome address. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malvina Talik, for the nice introduction. As you said, my name is Gerhard Machel and I'm head of uh, the Department of European Politics at the Karl Renner Institute, the political academy of the Austrian Social Democrats. A warm welcome also from my side and on behalf of the Karl Renner Institute. As uh, Malvina Talik mentioned, this is a serious uh, uh, joint discussion organized jointly by three institutions. All these three institutions have a special focus on Central and Eastern Europe. I would say that uh, uh, events and the elections, etc., in Central and Eastern Europe uh, belong to the uh, core mission of the IDM, but also the Karl Renner Institute and the Political Academy of the ÖVP have a special interest in this region. Tomorrow and Saturday, the inhabitants, the population of the Czech Republic are called upon to vote for a new parliament, more precisely, uh, the 200 members of the Chamber of Deputies, the lower house of the parliament. And with, with this event, we have a last minute opportunity to shed a light on the electoral campaign and the situation in the country and on a possible outcome of the elections. As I see it, there are three most important questions in with regarding to the elections. The first one, as I see it, is will Prime Minister Babish be able to secure another term in office? We all know that Mr. Babish is a very controversial figure and the last minute revelations of the so-called Pandora Papers uh, increased uh, the, co the controversy around his figure. Uh, the report unveiled the offshore dealings and hidden assets of Mr. Babish, namely a chateau property in France. Will these revelations have an impact on the outcome of the elections? So this is the first question. The second is decisive question and this is very much linked to the first one is if the coalition of the three, 
of the three uh, center right parties will be able to form a government will they be able to to get in first place and the third question as i see it, the most important question that is uh, the fate of the social democrats according to the latest poll it will be a very tight race if they will be able to enter into the parliament these are some of the issues we are going to elaborate uh, in the following discussion uh, we will also analyze the electoral law, the election campaign, the polls, the balance sheet of the government, etc. And as Malvina Talik said, uh, we have uh, uh, several renowned experts with us. Thank you very much for this. Um, before giving the floor back to, to Malvina, I would also like to say thank you to to our cooperation partners, EIDM, especially Mr. Sebastian Schaeffer and Daniel Mart Martinek for the good cooperation. Thank you. And special thanks also to the Politische Akademie of the ÖVP, represented by Felix Ofner and Loritz Jan. Many thanks for the good cooperation, as always. I wish you all a fruitful and interesting debate. And having said this, the floor is your back to, to you, Malvina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this welcome address and your, your kind words. And now before we delve into our discussion, Daniel, Mar Daniel Martinek will provide us with a briefing so we can better understand the situation in the Czech Republic ahead of elections. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marvina. Also, warm welcome from my side and good morning to everyone who is joining us today for our discussion. Let me just uh, shortly uh, share my screen since I not only prepared the written version of the briefing, but I also prepared kind of PPT presentation so you can have a nice visual overview of the pre-election situation in Czechia. I hope that it works and it's uh, the presentation is visible. So yeah, uh, today we are discussing the parliamentary elections in the Czech, Czech Republic. Um, sorry. Uh, just to give you a short introduction, the um, uh, almost exactly one year after the regional and Senate elections in October 2020, the the parliamentary elections are going to be held, as Gerhard already mentioned, uh, tomorrow and the day after, uh, on 8th and 9th uh, October uh, 2021. Um, during the already eight elections since the foundation of the Czech state in 1993, in total uh, 200 members uh, are going to be elected uh, for the lower house uh, of the parliament of the Czech Republic. Uh, these are coming from in total 14 constituencies uh, or let's say regions and they are going to be elected for another four-year term 22 uh, registered political entities uh, are running in the in the election campaigns uh, eight of which have a certain or real chance to enter the uh, the parliament uh, the the Czech uh, Chamber of Deputies has in total, uh, as I said already, uh, 200 seats. Uh, and uh, to win the majority, 101 seats uh, are needed. Uh, because of the um, pandemic, uh, because of the current pandemic situation in Czechia, the Ministry of Interior uh, decided that the quarantined people, if it's the case, can cast their votes um, be it uh, in uh, from car in these so-called drive-in uh, facilities or uh, by the portable uh, ballot box, um, and uh, every Czech citizen who is uh, 18 years old, at least on the second day of the elections, is eligible to cast a vote. Uh, now let me proceed um, uh, to kind of technical issues. 
regarding the change of the electoral system or electoral law, which happened in February this year, uh, based on a complaint of a group of senate senators coming from the current opposition party's uh, Stan, Starostowe uh, Anezawisli, the mayors and independents, Kare uh, UCSL, the Christian Democratic Union, and the uh, party Top 09. Uh, the complaint was about that the elector, that the current or now already the former uh, electoral law was uh, was not fair and was not equal when it comes to the uh, vote right and to the distribution of the seats uh, according the according to the share of the of the votes casted. Um, I prepared for you two tables where you can see better, where you can take a better uh, understanding of what is going actually on. Um, uh, firstly, uh, the entry thresholds for the electoral coalitions uh, have been changed uh, in, in the sense that uh, for single party or movements, uh, the entry threshold remains uh, the same by 5%. Uh, while uh, for the two-member coalitions, two-party coalitions, the entry threshold changed from 10% uh, to 8%, and for the three or or three or respectively multi-member coalitions, the threshold changed uh, from 15 respectively 20% to 11%. Also, as I already mentioned, the the distribution of the mandates, uh, respectively the seats, uh, has, has been changed uh, due to the change in the electoral law. Uh, just for your imagination, uh, in the second table, you can see the ratio of votes to mandates. So for example, the, the, the mayors and independence party won in 2017 uh, yeah, uh, around 5% of votes but they get at the end of the day only six seats in the in the parliament whereas uh, ano party who won with almost 30 percent uh, get yeah, over 70 uh, seats in the parliament so we can we could see that uh, yeah the electoral system uh, which was uh, by the way uh, enforced since uh, 2001 uh, was in uh, yeah some respects uh, yeah we would say uh, unfair or more uh, descendants, more, um, yeah, that the small parties have profited uh, less from, from this electoral law. But I really uh, do believe that we will also touch upon this uh, topic in our upcoming discussion and then maybe we can uh, discuss it more deeply. Um, when it comes to another topic, which I also written in the briefing, um, I would like to introduce you a little bit to the running political entities, their main candidates, and their political orientations. So we have here at the first place the winner of the uh, last elections uh, four years ago, the Anno Party. Uh, of course, everyone knows his uh, main candidate and the founder and the leader of the party, Andrei Babiš. Um, on the second place, uh, we have uh, the newly formed coalition um, Spolu, or in English, together with the main candidate uh, Petr Fiala, who is coming from the ODS party, the Civic Democratic Party. And this question is also composed not only by ODS, but also by KDU CSL, the Christian Democratic Union, and Top 09. On the second place, we have the Pirates and Mayors, another newly, newly established coalition. Uh, they formed this coalition uh, also last year. I think it was in December. The uh, main candidate uh, was, nom uh, as a main candidate, was nominated Ivan Bartosz, coming from the Pirate Party. Um, on, the third, on the fourth place, we have Freedom and Direct Democracy Party, SPD, with its leader, Tomio Okamura. Um, uh, by many uh, actually, uh, by many perceived as a right wing, sometimes even a far right uh, populist party, um, hardly Eurosceptic. Um, then we have a communist party of Bohemia and Moravia with its leader, uh, Wojciech Filip. Uh, yeah, Czech Social Democrats uh, with its leader, Jan Hamacek, who are also in the current government. 
um, together with uh, yeah, with support or tolerance by the Communist Party. And then uh, we have kind of freshly uh, established uh, uh, two or yeah, one party and one coalition. The, the first one is Oath Party, Přísaha, with its leader, uh, Robert Schlachta, uh, who uh, his agenda is uh, revolves around uh, anti-corruption efforts, um, yeah, um, fighting against these uh, shady practices in politics, uh, you know, uh, investigating these linkages between um, political and business activities uh, and so on. And last but not least, we have this coalition, as I mentioned already, the Tricolor Citizens Movement, uh, together with uh, Free Citizens Party and uh, Freeholder Party, with its leader, Zuzana Majerová Zahradníková. So that was a brief introduction of the running political uh, entities. Uh, now I would like to proceed uh, to another part and that uh, and these are the election results from the last election. So as we can see, the sovereign winner of the past elections uh, was the party ANO with its leader Andre Babiš. They achieved almost 30%. And then we have uh, three parties which uh, achieved around 10%, uh, the OVS, Pirates, uh, and SPD. Uh, and then uh, we had these small parties, communists, uh, social democrats, uh, Christian Democratic Union, top 09 and uh, mayors. And uh, so from what we can see here is actually that already back then, four years ago, uh, the Czech uh, political landscape was already quite fragmented. And as we can see from current uh, opinion polls or from the current overview of the uh, running parties, uh, the forming of two so-called democratic blocks or coalitions actually didn't prevent us from uh, fragmentation of political spectra, I would say. we Although we have two coalitions together with uh, Four uh, with five parties, we can still see that the uh, that the political spectrum is quite fragmented, and as I already mentioned, we have uh, like eight political parties which has a uh, chance to enter the future government. Let me uh, now focus a little bit on these two uh, coalitions, um, uh, the coalition polo or together, if you want, uh, if you want so. Um, as I said, uh, this one represents the so-called democrat, one of the democratic blocks. And what is the unifying element of these three parties is that um, they are um, yeah, more or less conservative, uh, but although they have some differences in their um, approaches, uh, perspectives on certain matters, they were able to find a common ground and they were able to form uh, this coalition back in October 2020. The second coalition, the Pirates and Mayors, uh, yeah, they also formed the coalition last year. Um, there are also definitely some unifying elements, um, let's say pro, um, kind of progressive, liberal, uh, liberal approach. Um, Whereas when it comes to the electorate itself, uh, the pirates are quite well established in bigger cities in Czechia. Uh, for example, in Prague, they are in coalition in Prague, Brno, Ostrava. Uh, uh, whereas the, the party mayors are quite well established in the smaller uh, towns, uh, in villages, in these uh, rural areas. Uh, yeah, since they are the they representatives are the mayors themselves. Um, I would like maybe at this point touch upon a little bit this uh, geopolitical uh, perspective of the of the current elections, as we can see also from the political ideologies of these specific countries. We see that yeah, most of them are let's say pro-European, pro-Western. Uh, where uh, the only parties which are kind of uh, Eurosceptical or maybe uh, hard Eurosceptical 
uh, is the SPD party of Tomio Okamura, uh, the Communist Party, and also the, the coalition TSS. So we can see from this overview that also yeah, these elections has a certain uh, geopolitical dimension. And I think that will be definitely uh, also a crucial element when it comes to, to the yeah, post-election uh, negotiations. Uh, let me also uh, touch upon a little bit uh, regarding the smaller parties, as I also written in my briefing. Uh, I think the role of the smaller parties will be crucial in the post-election negotiations, since, um, since there is a question if these are able to enter the parliament, if they can uh, get over the 5% threshold or if they were fall under the 5% uh, threshold. In any case, if they manage to do so, um, that would mean that uh, the position of the, of the party ANO, maybe also with the involvement of SPD party, uh, will be improved or stronger, uh, so to say. Whereas uh, when these small parties are not going uh, to enter the parliament, I think the negotiation positions uh, will be uh, better on behalf of these two, uh, yeah, so to say, democratic uh, coalitions. Of course, it's, uh, it's unclear who is going to be the winner as the opinion sh pools, uh, shows. It's going to be probably the party, the ANO party of Andrei Babish. Um, so uh, probably uh, Andrei Babish uh, will be uh, yeah, most probably uh, nominated by the Czech president Miloš Zeman to form a government. At the same time, there is a probab probability that it's not going to be the case that the party ANO will win the elections. Maybe they will land on the second place. Uh, yeah, there in that case, it remains to see if the Czech president is going uh, to nominate Andrei Babish uh, to form a government anyway. I, uh, I believe we also are going to go a little bit deeper into this topic. What can we uh, expect if something like that is going to happen? And yeah, what will, in general, what will be the role of the Czech president uh, after, after the elections? So that would be all uh, on my side for the moment. And uh, 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 thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the to the discussion. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for this very um, informative briefing, which gave us a great insight into the Czech political um, system, scene, and the electoral system. And it also offers a great starting point for our discussion, um, because I would like to uh, ask first questions about what has changed, what is new, what is different uh, in this um, election. And I will start by asking Pat Hust about this electoral law that Daniel mentioned at the very beginning in his briefing. Uh, how do you see this law? Do you think it was necessary to uh, introduce it, especially so uh, briefly before uh, the elections, just a couple of months, as Daniel mentioned? Do you think it can improve the quality of democracy in the Czech Republic or will it rather to further fragmentation? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll begin from the point of view of timing of the change. Um, the timing was probably the, the, the least lucky thing about all this uh, amendment or the constitutional court decision uh, on the electoral law. Uh, many experts agreed that the Czech electoral law would, of course, need a reform, that there are some weaknesses, weak points, which actually Daniel mentioned, uh, especially this disproportionality between the share of votes and share of seats, uh, consequently, uh, as a result of all these uh, electoral law countings. So there is no doubt that the uh, law needed some improvement, it needed some, some amendment. Uh, the timing, um, I don't know how much we can blame actually constitutional court for this, they said they've been they've been working on it for the entire period. Uh, I don't know the schedule of, of constitutional court so cannot prove whether it is right or, or wrong. Uh, what 
has become a reality was that the political parties, of course, had to act very quickly, very swiftly. And it wasn't actually sure at the point uh, of the announcement of the, the result by the Constitutional Court, whether there will be actually a law, a valid law uh, for the elections. Luckily, from this point of view, luckily, we have a law which is in effect, we have a law which now will be applied and we will see what the consequences will be. Uh, the, the changes that were made, they will uh, partially improve or, or um, fix the main weakness, the main point that was mentioned by both the complaint by, by senators and then later by the constitutional court, uh, but only partially. The main problem, uh, which is at the core of all this disproportionality between the share of votes and share of seats, is the different size of electoral districts. That's the main, main point, that's the main problem. And this problem hasn't been fixed. Uh, it hasn't been fixed because the regions are uh, the regions which are electoral districts for the purposes of uh, Chamber of Deputies elections. They are also a self-administrating district, so they serve other purposes as well. So it's not so easy just to make this and say we'll change, uh, we'll change uh, the, the district uh, uh, territorial composition of Czech Republic. So there were some options like whether we should make uh, Czech Republic for the purposes of election just one electoral district, which would of course be uh, the most proportional one and from a certain point of view more fair. Uh, however, uh, there were some, some uh, um, like questions whether creating one electoral district wouldn't lead to a bigger centralization of political parties that, uh, that would even more stress the role of the headquarters, the party headquarters, since you wouldn't have these regional structures of, of political parties, or you would have these regional structures of political parties, but they would not be directly involved in, in making uh, the party lists in each of the regions. So this is, this is one of the problems that it, that it um, strengthens the, the role of the party headquarters and weakens the role of regions. And I think if you were asking whether it will be more democratic, undemocratic, whether it will, uh, it will improve democracy, uh, the decentralization is always, uh, goes always hand in hand with democratization. So I think this centralization of party processes regarding uh, uh, the formation of party lists would probably be a little bit, uh, uh, I would say diversion from uh, definitely internal party democratic principles than if we have these uh, 14 regions. But with the 14 regions remaining, the main problem remains as well regarding, uh, regarding this disproportionality between elections, uh, election uh, uh, scores and the share of mandates because we have this Karlovarsky or Karlovy Vary region and Liberec region, which are very small regions, very little populated regions. Therefore, there is uh, just a few mandates distributed and to reach to a mandate, it's, uh, you need actually much higher natural threshold. What Daniel was introducing was this legal threshold, 5%, what you need to, to uh, cross in order to, to be able to uh, uh, get into scrutiny and, and uh, 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 into the counting of the mandates. But there is something which is also called a natural threshold, which is usually higher. And it's, it's higher in you, if, you, uh, if you distribute just few mandates. So it was much harder for political parties to get a mandate in these small regions where you distributed just four, five, six, seven, seats and then compare with Prague or Southern Moravian, Moravian region or uh, Moravian Silesian regions where you, where you distribute more than 20 mandates. And of course, it's much more easier for political parties to get a mandate over there. So the problem in some way still remains, although some improvements uh, were made regarding the fixing of the disproportionality. So those reforms were actually just like the first step in the reforms of the electoral law, if I understand it right. But we'll it, see it, whether it as a positive step. Uh, yeah, that. and we will see if there will be after elections something like a stage two of the electro electoral reform, because now they needed to make the electoral reform very quickly, very swiftly, uh, in order to hold the elections and to have a valid law. We'll see if uh, once the elections are over, once the new Chamber of Deputies uh, convenes, whether there will be an initiative to also fix this uh, 
I say territorial aspect of uh, electoral law. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like now to continue this topic of new tendency and what has changed. And I'm turning to Aneta. Um, you have been observing the political marketing of Czech uh, parties. And uh, could you tell us, is there anything different in the way they communicate with the voters this year? Has the discourse changed maybe? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. I think that the discourse changed from the election we saw in uh, 2017. Uh, the biggest change is that we have the, these two new opposition blocks. That's something that we have uh, never seen before. We saw some, let's say, willingness of some parties to form something more compact. In 2017, we, for example, saw that the leaders of uh, Christian Democrats and uh, the independents and mayors slept in one tent to show people that they are willing to, to cooperate. But uh, now we can really see two new blocks and then we, we, they are opposition blocks and their main campaign is the, the anti babish uh, the change the fight against the, the government that was here during the COVID and before. So that's something uh, quite new for uh, the Czech politics. And it's, we can also see it in the marketing because uh, now politics is about marketing and how the parties are targeting uh, to, to voters, to potential voters and the people. Uh, very often in Czech Republic, we are saying that uh, the campaign of Ano, of Andrei Babish, is uh, perfect because it's really attracting the people he wants to attract. It means uh, older people, uh, people who are somehow afraid of uh, the new world, let's say, of globalization, of uh, some kind of progressive trends we can see in the West. So Babish is really playing this emotional game with the people and it works and it works very well. On the, on the other hand, we have uh, these opposition blocks that are targeting different type of people that are targeting to highly educated people, like the middle class, upper class, and their campaign is uh, completely different. Uh, they also sometimes uh, are trying to somehow you know, contact people through emotions to, to kind of uh, attack their hearts, but they are not very good uh, in, <laughs> in, this, in these efforts, I think. And it's, um, it's like every party knows what to do and how to attract uh, their voters. The problem, for example, we can see is with the social democrats. Uh, because their campaign was really, really problematic. Uh, we saw that they were quite lacking of the real topics. Uh, so at the end, they decided to join this uh, anti babish uh, anti anor uh, campaign, which is quite uh, weird if we uh, like because they are in the government right now with this with this party. So they are quite somehow like shooting in their own, own leg. Uh, so we can see that in for some parties, uh, even if their programs, like the real election programs, are full of interesting topics, uh, full of these kind of um, progressive topics like decentralization uh, of uh, energy now like when the energy prices are rising, it could be great topic for all the parties to show how to solve the situation. But what we see is only the thing that uh, one dog blames Babish for um, the high prices and Babish is just like blaming the others that they are only in a position and they never did some, anything and blah, blah, blah. So it's quite sad, I have to say, because like me, for example, as a young person, I cannot see any kind of offer from, uh, from the political parties. Even if we are like living in the world of uh, political marketing, uh, I'm definitely in some kind of group that wasn't targeted by, by, the, by the parties. And uh, that's quite sad that young people, young people with some kind of uh, 
West, Western progressive minds are somehow left behind the, the political campaign and the political, ga political game is uh, played in completely different field. And it's really sad. And I, before, like, uh, like in past two, three weeks, I was really analyzing the programs of the parties, of all the parties uh, that Daniel mentioned uh, during his great presentation. So I saw in the program so many great topics that could be somehow emphasized during the campaign that could, I think, attract uh, the people. But unfortunately, the campaign is only about uh, this kind of uh, change, but we don't know uh, ch change uh, like how the change should look like. Uh, we don't, do not really know the visions of the parties, and it's, I think it's a problem of uh, Czech politics uh, of the past years that we are lacking visions, we are lacking uh, leadership, we are lacking strategy. Uh, it's like everything is kind of empty, even the speeches of politicians uh, are empty. We all know that our prime minister is really not a good speaker, uh, that he sometimes uh, even has problems with, with the Czech language, and that uh, we can see in his speeches that uh, in his mind there is a bit, bit chaos. Uh, but even the opposition blocks, we cannot see some kind of uh, leader speeches uh, that could mobilize the people. So I'm quite afraid about the turnout of the elections. Uh, we saw that uh, even like in 2017, we had like 60, 60 percent, 61 almost percent. And I'm really afraid that this year, even if everyone said that these elections are the most important ones in the modern history of the Czech Republic, I'm afraid that all these issues I spoke before will distract people and uh, people are now puzzled about the politics and that they will like lose hope for this change. And that I'm really afraid that many people will remain at home uh, on Friday and Saturday and that the turnout will be quite low and that would be a great problem like not only for like these elections and their outcomes but like for the Czech democracy in a, in a whole like for the yeah for the Czech democracy because people are so tired of politics that it could be difficult to to mobilize them again and to you know like um to, to show them that politics is not just an area, arena, where uh, politicians are fighting one against other, but that, that politics is about some topics that are related to their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And just a quick question, because um, from what you said, the op opposition is, um, its main topic is um, removing Babish from the office. Babish in turn is very emotional uh, in his speeches. But could you tell me, in, in your uh, opinion, is this campaign more about personalities, about Babish, or is it about issues, or are issues totally in the shade? Yeah, it's, it's true that it's about Babish. It's not even about the opposition leaders, because uh, when, you, when you check, for example, polls uh, among the people who are voting for the center-right coalition of SPOLU, even people that are willing to vote for this party do not think that Petr Fiala, the main candidate, is a leader. So we are missing like personalities uh, in this opposition bloc. In the second, uh, in the second block of the pirates and independents and mayors, we had this kind of dispute whether Ivan Bartosz or Vitra Kushan should be the leader. And now many people are convinced that Vitra Kushan is the leader, but in fact, Ivan Bartosz is the candidate for, for, the, for the prime minister. So it's really about Babish and uh, about like if, if the opposition bloc will somehow beat Babish. Uh, and it's really, really, really sad that it's not, not about the real topics. Maybe the only kind of topic that is visible in election is, uh, it's quite paradox, but it is the EU and like the Czech membership uh, in the EU, because it's again, it's partly about Babish, 
because when we uh, when you open the the election program of ano it begins with the wording about the role of the Czech Republic in the in the European Union it's about the Czech presidency that is uh, in the second half of uh, 2022 and there is written that Babish will protect the Czech sovereignty uh, and that he will protect us from this kind of uh, rising role of European Commission and European Parliament. And this is also what we see in uh, Babish campaign, in the posters uh, around the streets. That's what he is uh, sending in his letters to potential voters that uh, he will protect us from the European Union. And there is nothing more. Thank you. So, so we see that the campaign is very much about Babish. Um, but at the same time, uh, um, a while ago, uh, we, uh, we saw a huge wave of support for the opposition parties and it even looked that they could lose, uh, that the, the Babish could, uh, could lose to them. And I would like to ask uh, Daniel, uh, what do you think was the reason for such a, a huge support for those opposition parties? Is it because of, of um, mistakes that Babish might have made, or is it uh, because those parties had a good winning strategy? What do you think? Yeah, thank you, Marvina. Uh, interesting question, because what we can observe from the opinion pools is actually that uh, during the last uh, couple of weeks, actually the ANO party is dominating the opinion pools. But that wasn't the case at the very beginning, uh, I mean, like a couple of months ago, where we saw that actually the, the opposition block of pirates and mayors were dedicating a lot of efforts and time in their election campaign. And I think that's the reason why they were so successful in these opinion pools, you know, that they were back then uh, yeah, quite attractive and appealing to the voters and to the electorate. But yeah, that's something which uh, which changed during the time. And we, what we can see actually with this opposition block is that they are quite losing uh, the support of the electorate because yeah, as also uh, Anita mentioned already, I think the problem is that when we observe these discussions, you know, the essence or some um, factual debate is missing. And I think that's uh, when we are speaking about the target group of these opposition, opposition blocks. Yeah, as also uh, uh, has been said by Aneta, these uh, uh, middle upper class electorate, uh, educated people, you know, I think this is this election campaign, this anti babish campaign is not appealing for them because they are just missing this constructive dialogue, constructive arguments, yeah, some visions, you know, uh, of course, not, not not everything can be done in this four year term uh, in the office, but you know some substantial some essence of uh, factual debate is missing, and I think that's one of the reasons why the preferences decreased in the uh, past couple of weeks for these uh, uh, opposition blocks, uh, and as also Mar uh, Aneta already mentioned, uh, the simply simply speaking the the political communication and marketing of Babish, particularly of his marketing team, is simply the best one. Yeah, honestly speaking, we I think we have to we have to say that uh, today that they are really doing a good job when it comes to political communication. They are uh, playing with these simple arguments, and you know, for the majority of people who are, if I may say so, in this way who are living from one day to another, you know, and who are actually caring about the politics and elections from the rather financial point of view. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the campaign of uh, Parto Ani is definitely the most appealing one. And it's, uh, yeah, um, the, I think in that sense that the, the lack of this constructive debate is actually uh, well targeting and well played by Babish and his party. Um, and I think he's, the Babish party is putting all his efforts into that because I think he sees the, these elections as the last chance, you know, uh, to, to win in these elections, to remain in the politics if we don't, if we don't consider 
his potential invo involvement of, in the presidential uh, campaign, uh, which is going to take place in, in two years from now. But yeah, uh, at the same time, I would say if, if you would have a look on these debates, which we seen during the uh, past uh, weeks, um, there were some uh, efforts or yeah, efforts or experiments, so to say, to maybe establish some constructive dialogue when it comes to the topics uh, such as uh, reform of the pensions, you know, um, health policies, uh, which was targeting or addressing particularly the young people because the situation uh, when it comes to the housing policy is quite, uh, quite difficult uh, currently in Czechia, maybe not only in Czechia, uh, but also um, other topics uh, such as infrastructure, uh, uh, the education system, you know, um, they were, uh, the politicians or the leaders were also touching upon such issues. But I think what also was missing in this regard was, you know, this self-reflection, you know, these lessons learned, what went wrong, what well went during the last, let's say, 30 years. And I, I think, in my opinion, it's also this missing self-reflection is also contributing to the fact that, uh, as has been already mentioned, the people are tired of politics, you know, and then they can't see, even after 30 years, if you take it from this perspective, that they can't see um, yeah, any results or any improvement when it comes to their living conditions. Uh, also, maybe compared to the other countries in the region, to our neighbor, uh, here I'm speaking about Germany or Austria and so on. So I think this dissatisfaction not only contributed to the success of, of Babish uh, uh, back in 2011 when he founded his movement, and uh, it also contributed to the decline of these so-called established parties or these oldest parties. But I think this dissatisfaction is also a crucial element in, the, in upcoming elections. And I think it will also, uh, in, uh, in a certain extent, influence also the water turnout. Yeah. It is in a way sad when people don't exert their basic democratic right, which is, which is to vote, and they actually um, prefer not to, to cast a vote. But I, I hope that uh, turnout will be higher than, than uh, prognosed at the moment. Uh, since this election is so much about Babish, I would like to talk about Babish still for a while. And I have a question to, to all of you, actually, because as uh, was mentioned at the very beginning during introductions, uh, the so-called Pandora uh, papers were revealed last Sunday. And then what do you think? Uh, will they have any um, impact on the elections? And what impact? Um, how did Babish um, react to that? What was with his political marketing? Um, what's your take on that? And whoever wants to start, please do take the floor. So if I, if I may begin. Uh, regarding Babish supporters, I don't expect any, any impact at all. Uh, the explanation is quite simple. Babish has been already described by many of, uh, many of the statements uh, and, uh, and speakers here as quite controversial person. He has gone through many cases, affairs. He is under criminal investigation. He is under the conflict of interest investigation from the European Union. And as you can see on his polls, nothing, nothing has ever heard him. The only thing that temporarily, temporarily, I stress this word, heard him was uh, managing of the pandemics. But as we see, he's back on the track. So now, no pandemics is no more a political issue. So no one much uh, talks about pandemics as a political issue, of course, as a social issue, it's, a, it's still on. And his polls are back up. And this, is, this leads me to my, my, of my opening, uh, opening line of this question, of this answer, is that, again, no, I don't expect that uh, any of his voters, his supporters, will be anyhow influenced by the revelation of, uh, of these uh, Panama, uh, Pandora papers. Uh, 
maybe they will even more uh, firmly stick behind him so that they would support him as we've seen as we've seen before uh, during all the previous uh, cases what it can cause is that might mobilize some anti babish voters who are like still considering whether to go to the polls or not so they might go to the polls being uh, being um, motivated by this uh, revelation but I don't expect this would be like the masses of people and that would lead to a completely change of the outcome of, uh, of the elections. Although we now don't know what the impact is on public opinion, because now we are in the period that public opinion polls are uh, forbidden to be to be released. So we don't have any uh, any um, immediate reactions from the society. So we will see on the election outcomes, whether it had some in impact or not. But on the other hand, since the last polls were already very close uh, or showing that some of the parties on the top are very close to each other within the uh, statistical margin or within the uh, statistical error. Uh, and if it happens that ANO will not win, but for example, the Together Alliance will win, I don't think that we could make the conclusion that it was because of the Pandora Papers. Uh, another reason why I think that the Pandora Papers will not have any, any major or huge or decisive effect on, on uh, the election outcome is that, frankly, not many people understand the system of offshores. I don't understand the system of offshores. I, I say it openly here. Uh, I don't understand how it works. Uh, and I think this is the position of most of the people in Czech society. I don't have any data to prove my point. This is just the uh, impression, I admit. It might be wrong, but my impression is that this topic uh, is, taught, is something that if the people would like to get into it, they would get lost. And this probably there would be a simple way how to explain it to the voters, but I think that that the opposition parties are not using this potential to explain it, let's say, easily, uh, to simplify it a little bit. When they are still talking about the offshores, 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 not many people will actually know what it all is about. Yeah, if I can continue, uh, I absolutely agree that the Pandora Papers can strengthen the position of Andrei Babish, it's giving him more visibility. Uh, it's just, yeah, that's something that his voter likes when Babish are like fighting against something that was written by media. I think it's quite important to mention the role of Czech media and uh, in this election campaign, because media and journalists are often targets, um, they are attacked by politicians and uh, it's connected with the trust of people to institutions, to journalists, media, to kind of democracy pillars of uh, the country of the Czech Republic. We now we are now suffering from really trust crisis. Let's say uh, even when we compare it with other European countries, in in I think in every country the trust in government was a bit like shaken by the, by the pandemic, but in the Czech Republic, the fall was the biggest one uh, among the, the, the European countries. Uh, the same was with, uh, with media, uh, also like with the public broadcasting media. Uh, people simply now don't really believe to what's written in the newspapers, so what's on the inter internet. It's really kind of crisis of trust uh, in, in democratic institution. Uh, what then what was mentioned, the, the kind of offshore uh, problematic, how it is complicated, it's absolutely true. I remember that, for example, one year ago when uh, and me as a journalist, I was writing stories about the way how the European Union wants to regulate offshores. And I was still thinking how to write about offshores and not using the word offshores uh, and uh, yeah now suddenly like and we were like all the journalists were trying to avoid this word because it's it's English word and for Czech people 
when they see something like that, it's already like it's kind of red light that it's something that they will probably do, don't understand. And now the word offshore was everywhere, it was everywhere, and it, it was quite a like, like shame. And uh, really, like the Czech Pirate Party, they, they tried to explain it, but they did not succeed. Uh, because they then switched to kind of like money laundering uh, affairs, but still it's it was too late and people, I think that uh, like it's not only Czech people, but uh, people like in general forget uh, very quickly what happened like two days ago, three days ago, and especially during election campaign when we see more and more accusations every day. I think that tomorrow Pandora Papers will not be a story uh, for, for Czech, Czech public. It will be a story for um, the European Union because we saw, for example, yesterday discussion in the European Parliament where they also discussed about uh, Babish and about other politicians and leaders that were uh, mentioned in these uh, leaked documents. Uh, so I think that we will see some kind of new, for example, European or even global regulation or some kind of efforts how to um, even make these uh, practices illegal, uh, but it will have, I think, no, um, no impacts on the, on the Czech election. And what other has been said, and I think it's absolutely true that um, like even the pandemic it was topic uh, during the spring when we saw the rise of the Czech pirates. Uh, but now the pandemic is not a political topic, but it's also not a topic for the public. Uh, yesterday I spoke with, uh, with uh, Martin Buchti, who is uh, the director of uh, STEM agency, like the uh, research agency that is like really focusing on the, the Czech society and the democracy. And he told me that according to their last polls, like majority of people think that pandemic is over, that it is not a topic anymore. And it's something quite scary when we see that uh, the level of uh, like, the, like um, we, uh, I, I don't know the vaccination rate of what is right now, but it's definitely not uh, sufficient to be protected. And we also see that the number of people who are infected with COVID is rising again. The same goes for the people who are hospitals. But for the Czech society, the pandemic is over. And that's something maybe also related to what I said before, that people are forgetting uh, important things that happened that hit the country very, very quickly. And yeah, elections are tomorrow and we will see what will happen today. I'm still quite afraid that something new will uh, appear that uh, we saw it also, for example, when we had the presidential elections, that really the, the day before elections, we saw the new billboards where it was written that Miller Zeman, our current president, uh, is saying no to illegal migration and that the opposite candidate is uh, pro illegal migration. So I'm still afraid what will we see tomorrow morning, what will happen uh, this afternoon. Uh, but I think that everything that will happen will only strengthen the position of uh, Andrei Babish. Yeah, if I if I may continue, I fully agree with what are, has been already said. Maybe I would just add one thing. What also uh, Aneta men mentioned right now at the end of his uh, of her uh, statement is that you know I really do believe that certain politicians uh, facilitate or promote this uh, disinformation uh, disinformation uh, direction while contributing to the distrust amongst the society, amongst the population in that way. You know, because for example, if you open the homepage of the Anno party, you will see the picture of protesters of disrupting of society with the title, you know, if you want something like that, want for vote for the pirates, you know, for the pirate party. And I think this is something, you know, and this is something which it's not true at all, you know. It's not like that uh, the Pirate Party would promote uh, a migration in the way that everyone should host someone from third parties, uh, third countries at home or something like that. It's completely, it's 
it's nonsense, it's a disinformation. And I think in that way, in this political communication and campaign, I think the politicians, not all of them, of course, certain politicians are, uh, are contributing to this distrust in politics. And yeah, while using this emotional side uh, of, of communicating, it's, it's creating this climate in the society, this deep polarization at the same time, you know, because people, of course, are afraid of this, of, of this development, if they may uh, come in the future. Of course, there are global changes, which as a small country such as Czechia can't influence. And we should definitely be prepared for such changes. Uh, and I think also majority of people, or the society is not prepared for these changes because they don't understand these changes. Uh, and yeah, these changes, be it migration, uh, be it, uh, I don't know, uh, digitalization or in general, some transformation in the societies. Um, these are just changes which are misused during, uh, during the politician, during the electoral campaigns uh, before, uh, during the pre-election uh, situation. And I think this also contributes a lot to the distrust uh, or to the politics and yeah, to, to the whole climate in general. Mm, thank you. It's always a challenge to explain those very complex issues in, in simple words. And I feel some parties simply don't mention them at all or present them in a very black and white fashion. Uh, we have uh, half an hour to go and I would like to start uh, including our, our audience also into this uh, discussion. So dear audience, if you have questions, remember you can um, write them in chat, you can also raise your hand. Um, nevertheless, I will now also proceed with uh, questions about uh, uh, possible scenarios um, after the elections, because we talked a lot about uh, the campaign and, and changes. Um, my first question about those possible scenarios is um, directed at, at pet used. Like, what can we expect? Like, who can form a government with who, who will absolutely not form a government with another party? Um, what's your take on that? Mm, I will begin with answer you probably don't expect, but on the question what we can expect, anything. Uh, there are several scenarios which, for example, seem to be very uh, unrealistic at this moment, but still I definitely wouldn't rule them out. Uh, that's mainly the scenario of a possible cooperation between ANO and some of the today's democratic opposition parties. Although, and this is why I say that it might seem unrealistic right now, now we are in a pre-election campaign. The parties are communicating in completely different way than they will be communicating after the elections. Now, of course, both the democratic coalitions, if we would call them this way, uh, are saying no to coalition with ANO. These are the official statements. However, if you look a little bit inside, uh, especially inside ODS, and if you read uh, opinions of some of uh, individual members of ODS, the opinions that are so far presented more like a private opinions, not, <clears throat> sorry, not the official opinion of ANO, of ODS, then you can get some, let's say, very careful considerations that the coalition with ANO would not be totally ruled out, of course, provided two major uh, factors. Factor number one, Andrei Babish would not be part of it. Factor number two, that would be a solution in case Andrei Babish would be planning to make the coalition with SPD and communists. This, is, this leads me to another uh, alternative, which is being discussed or which has been discussed for a long period already. In case communist party makes it to the parliament, it's also on the threshold, on the, on the edge of the threshold. So it's still, 50-50 chance that, that they get or don't get there. So if they get there, there has been a, a discussed uh, uh, possible alliance between ANO, SPD and communists. Uh, it can be both the direct coalition alliance or a coalition or alliance based on some support of let's say minority 
ANO cabinet, which would be supported by the SPD and the communists, of course, uh, with some rewards for uh, this uh, tolerance or with this, this support. Uh, of course, this alliance, ANO, SPD and the communists would have um, probably some very uh, negative consequences for Babish on the international and European level. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Andrei Babish always focused on his personal issues and he's playing for everything in these elections, not only for his political future, he's playing for his personal future as well. As I mentioned, he's under criminal investigation. By elections, he will regain the immunity. So the parliament will again have to vote on lifting the immunity so that the criminal prosecution could continue. So he may use this as a way of, uh, as a, some kind of, um, some kind of bargain in in post-election uh, coalition formation. He may say, of course, uh, I I will go with a certain party that will guarantee me that they will not vote for lifting my immunity. This is maybe in this moment you can you can take it as a speculation, but I think this could be one of the these bargains that will be at, uh, at stake uh, during the post-election coalition formation. But returning to my original um, statement, which, which I said that some, some options which now seem to be unrealistic may actually turn out to be, uh, to be the, the one actually formed. Uh, the threat of ANO, SPD and communist might actually change these strategies and attitudes of uh, Either of the coalition, probably more. I would be I would be uh, focusing on the Together Alliance, or at least some of the members of the Together Alliance. We know that they agree that after the elections they will split into um, the original parties again. So it does not mean that the the whole trio, that all three parties will will enter the alliance or not. Uh, there are some people within ODS that say that they wouldn't be against uh, forming this alliance. There are some people in ANO who are very much in favor of uh, making coalition with ODS, especially the governor of the Moravian Silesian uh, region, uh, Ivo Vondrak, who has led uh, already second, or who, who has been leading the second term a coalition on the regional level, which includes both ANO and ODS, and says that there is no problem in, in existence and, and uh, this coalition, coalition works well. On the regional level, of course, we have to underline because there are some, of course, different issues, different interests of political parties. On regional level, there are less ideology, more of this uh, practical, uh, practical thing. But still, this is not a rare voice inside ANO, as well as it's not a rare voice inside ODS, uh, admitting that under some circumstances, the ODS should be open to cooperating with uh, Andrei Babish if it meant prevention of communists and SPD, the far right and, uh, far, right and far left parties from uh, getting, getting to power. The other question is, and it's even question with a uh, with a big question mark is what would be the reaction of the president for such uh, composition because we know that he has his own idea how the government should look like and he is sometimes very stubborn to go for for what he thinks is the best for his interests of course he has also some interests the leadership of the intelligence service uh, the russian companies and their involvement in nuclear power plant uh, uh, construction. So there is also a lot that he is playing for. And uh, it's a question what interests he will follow, whether he will follow his own interests, political interests, or interests of Andrei Babish, or interests of other political parties uh, that will take part in a coalition negotiations. But because, her, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, because then Zemet can actually um, help Anna win without winning, if I understand yes, that's, right. That's what I was planning to say, uh, that there is a third option as well. The minority cabinet of Anna, that wouldn't be supported by anyone, that would, for example, lose the confidence vote, but still could be held at power by Miloš Zeman, because Czech constitution 
does not give any limits, time frames when the new government has to be appointed if the previous government loses confidence. So we can imagine a situation that Andrei Babish will be appointed by the president as the prime minister. Andrei Babish will not be able to form majority coalition or to find the support for his minority government, will lose the confidence vote, will resign, but any government that resigns by the constitution is actually assigned to temporarily state at power until the new government is appointed. That's what the constitution says. But there is no more, uh, no, no more about how long the situation can last. So technically, if president decides to keep such uh, uh, government at power for two months, three months, half a year, year, it's up to him. Well, he, it can be until the March 2023 in an extreme uh, scenario. When the, exp when the term of current president uh, expires, and then it will depend on the approach of uh, whoever comes after, after him. But if I take it into an extreme um, uh, position, this situation can last uh, as long as, uh, as uh, the main actor, meaning the president, will, will actually uh, want. And since this government will be actually at power just at the pleasure of the president, because the president would be the only one who could terminate this uh, government's mandate just by appointing a new one. Because as I said, once there is a temporary assignment, the temporary assignment ends in the moment of appointing of the new government. It, say, it, doesn't, says, uh, it doesn't say when the new government has to be appointed. It just says that by appointment of the new government, the, 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 the acting or caretaker government uh, term expires. So it will be kind of president's ace in the hand he will have that uh, mm -hmm. he can say, well, you have to follow my rules, my principles, my interests, or I can appoint another government and you're out. So these mm -hmm. are the three scenarios. I, sorry for being a little bit, little bit longer, but but uh, uh, three scenarios that uh, can actually happen after the elections. But uh, I return to my official statement, anything can happen. Thank you for outlining those, those uh, three scenarios. Uh, we're getting a little bit pressed for time, which means that we'll have to be a little bit briefer now. No, 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 that's um, <laughs> not referring to this. Um, and we have also some questions from the public. Maybe you've seen it already. Uh, Mr. Gerhard uh, Mikolaj asked, why is the Czech Social Democratic Party so weak? Um, who would like to answer this question? So if I may start, I will be, I will, I will be quick. I think that um, the so Czech Social Democrats are now in the kind of phase that was uh, before a case for the Civic Democrats, that they are somehow like close to the deepest ground and they just need to hit the ground and dust off. Uh, this process we saw with the Civic Democrats a few, uh, few years ago, now we see that they really kind of uh, relaunch themselves, they have a kind of new identity uh, and they are now the, let's say, leading opposition force. So they managed to, as I said, like this dust off process. And I think that's something that has to be also taken by the Czech Social Democrats. Uh, so um, I think that if they don't uh, reach the threshold and they will not enter the parliament, this process will be much more accelerated and then in the next election they could be strong uh, again. And the, why are they so weak? I think that the problem is that the, their voters, they just like shit to Babish. Uh, which is like we, we talked about this marketing, the targeting on the senior people and like these typical normal traditional voters of social democrats are now voting for rubbish. And the second like group of their voters is now in the pirate camp, let's say, because like pirate Czech pirates are now the kind of central left uh, force that is progressive. They have these like 
they are uh, trying to like uh, raise topics like housing and uh, like the future, uh, the uh, the pensions and the sustainability. So like these like the younger voters, more progressive voters are they, they just shifted to pirates. So that's uh, that's uh, my answer. Maybe if I can add something on a, uh, to these two last questions, I think, yeah, I would definitely agree with the, with the opinion that everything is actually possible after the elections. I think there is only one thing or one option which can be already ruled out, and that is the cooperation between Anno Party and the pirates. I think that's, the, that's, that's actually the only thing which we can expect from the post-election negotiations that these two parties are not going, or even maybe pirates and mayors in general, are not going uh, to cooperate with Anu Party. I think this is something we can consider as a no-go, so to say. And regarding the Social Democrats, I think, yeah, as Aneta already mentioned, I think it, the, the crucial problem is that the left-wing parties or the left specter, not only in the Czech Republic actually, is so much fragmented and you know, the voters can actually choose which party they are going to cast a vote when it comes to uh, left, leftist poli uh, policies and strategies. So yeah, as was already mentioned, we have the pirates. We have also the Anno party, which is yeah, originally like center, center right party. But at the same time, what we observed in the last couple of, yeah, I would say months, or maybe even years already, uh, yeah, we saw that they contributed to the increase of wages, for example, of certain population. Um, yeah, they were in general very much caring in, in that direction, uh, social policies and so on. Of course, the reason behind that, we can doubt that, you know, I think it's yeah, mostly because they just want to appeal to the voters and they, will, they want to buy their support. But yeah, I think the fragmentation of the left-wing parties is so high I think that that very much contributes to the decline of the social democrats uh, in in the Czech Republic, and I also think that uh, at the same time, you know, maybe the social democrats in Czech Republic are. I'm not. I don't want to say it like from the point of view that it's like one of the oldest parties in Czech Republic and so on, uh, that they are well established and so on. Uh, I think they are also not appealing to the voters in the way that they are not addressing the current problems in, in, in the way that would, uh, that would encourage the voters to support them. You know, I think the pirates or the mayors uh, together in this coalition are doing in that direction much more better and are uh, addressing these social issues uh, yeah, in a very um, more sufficient way when it comes to the communication and marketing and addressing these issues. Uh, can I also add something on the social Democrats? Of course, I mean, I just want to tell you that we have two more questions from the audience. Um, uh, yeah. so we could... I, I agree with the last point about this, uh, the, the issues that actually Social Democratic Party is raising. If you look at what issues they, they focus on, and if you take also, if you, if you look at how they present it, it's very discrepancic because uh, there has been, for example, the uh, video of uh, two candidates from the Prague list of Jana Maláčeva and Martin Stropnitsky. They call themselves the cool duo, Gustav Vojka. By this, they, it seems that they would be appealing to young voters using the word cool, husty, uh, but Look at the content of the video, of the first video. They are discussing the privatization of Czech railways and the privatization of Czech post office, like that they are against it. I don't think, um, I don't feel I'm old, I'm not young, but I'm not old yet, and, but I don't feel that young people are really, really now interested in whether the Czech post and Czech rails will be privatized or not. This is not a major issue for young generation. And frankly, anyone, anyone who has had any experience with Czech post in the Czech Republic will probably be voting for the privatization at this moment. Uh, so I don't think this is a wisely chosen topic in general. 
and definitely not a wisely chosen topic for whom they wanted to uh, appeal. But the same was four years ago. Four years ago, the Social Democratic Party was uh, uh, in the election campaign was again the party that's been in government before, the term before, 2013, 2017, they were in the government. They were the strongest party in the government. They had the prime minister. They had the minister of labor and social affairs. And the main, uh, main um, event I can remember from this campaign is that they were marching for higher wages. It was really a march. If you, uh, if you would not know these people, if you were a total stranger and you would encounter on the streets and you would see this march and demonstration for higher wages, and you said, oh, this is a protest against the government probably. Well, no way. This was a protest. This was a, a campaign event of the ruling party ruling party that has held the position of the prime minister and minister of social uh, affairs and labor and they are actually making like a like a union strike almost uh, which would really resemble an anti-governmental protest and you say these are the people who had a chance to influence it for the previous four years 13 to 17 and now again 17 to 21 again They've been at power, they've been in charge of the Ministry of Social, uh, social Affairs, Labor and Social Affairs, and they are again raising the issue of, of uh, against the cheap labor, uh, raising, raising the wages and similar. So selection of the topics and the appeal or, or whom they want to, to appeal. Uh, the next question from the audience uh, is from Alexandra de, de, de Cicin, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, from Pro Austrian Press Agency. What do you expect yeah. regarding the party of Mr. Uh, Slachta, Slachta? Who would like to take this question? Daniel, I see. Yeah, if, if I may. <laughs> maybe ladies first but yeah if i may continue uh yeah i think uh, it's you know i consider this party to be really like fresh from the oven party and i think uh the the chances of this party to enter to the government the chances that they will get over the five percent threshold is really low i don't think they with this anti-corruption uh, attitude or campaign uh yeah maybe we, we could also say a little bit populistic campaign. I don't think they are gonna, uh, they are going to reach uh, out to the electorate in general. And I think for them, it's it was simply difficult because yeah, as I said, they were established, I think at the beginning of this year, actually. So I think it's difficult, you know, to establish political party in a, on such a short notice and to, yeah, to get into the hearts of, of certain uh, share of electorate. So I think they are not going to make it to enter the parliament. And I think also people are kind of tired of this anti-corruption anti -corruption, um, tendencies or anti-corruption efforts, because you know what we saw also not only in the Czech Republic, but in the region in general, usually the parties who are the anti-corruption parties are <laughs> more or less also linked to the corruption in in many cases quite uh, hard hardly connected uh, uh, yeah, to the to the corruption and shady practices and controversial uh, controversial business uh, activities so i think yeah they are definitely not going to to make it to the parliament and um, yeah i think in general they don't play any, any significant role uh, in in the post election situation Thank you. The next question comes from uh, Konrad Kramer. Uh, why does the enormous economic growth and full employment not play a role in the campaign? And is migration only a regional topic or also um, a, a topic across the country? Anata, would you like to? Yes. Um, when it comes to economic growth and full employment, it's not a topic because it's something positive, I would say. It's something positive, something that is there, like Czech people are used to uh, this kind of like Czech tiger uh, issue that we are, like ever economy so far was uh, doing pretty well. Now we like the public debt is, uh, is among the like fastest rising in the EU, but still like 
we are kind of safe in this economic uh, matter. And we know that there will be problems in the future, but it's not the topic for now. Now the people, I think that like many people do not suffer from the impacts of the uh, COVID crisis. That's, it's the same, still same group of, uh, or, of people that were already vulnerable before the COVID. So I don't think that this like economic dimension is the topic for the, for the Czech people. Because when you need the job, you every time can find a job and that's, that's it. When it comes to migration, I think migration is um, like the topic for the whole country that there are no kind of uh, like regional, uh, regional dimensions. Uh, we have no regions that are somehow particularly affected by, by migration. Uh, it's kind of only bubble uh, of, um, of the political campaign that, that the uh, the ruling party ano will protect us from uh, illegal immigration, and it's more about kind of um, kind of areas that are not Prague. I think that the, the only like regional regional issue is that there are people living in Prague the people of the like the middle class upper class higher educated and then people in the regions uh, that are afraid for them the security is uh, the top topic uh, the security of their families the security of their everyday lives and they are not caring about this like economic issues etc so this is like the regional dimension i would uh, I, I can see in this migration debate Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I will now go to the to the last question, and there's a trick to it because I would like you to answer it in one sentence, maximum two. And this question is: <laughs> um, Do you think that those elections are a turning point for the Czech Republic, and why? Yes, why not? Who would like to start? I begin. Uh, yes, I think they are turning because uh, there is a real chance that uh, the new government could also be composed from uh, countries that would divert from uh, from parties that would divert from up to now uh, prevailing geopolitical uh, orientation of Czech Republic. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll quit here to promise to have only one or two sentences. So yes. Thank you. Another? Uh, according to me, uh, these elections are very, very important, but they are not this turning point. I think that the turning, election, turning point elections will be the presidential elections in uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Daniel, so one yes, one no. What's your opinion? Yes. What? So if, if I can see these two opinions, I should be somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> so no, I think in some respects, of course, I, I would fully agree with this geopolitical positions. So if there are parties which are like your skeptic and maybe like seeking improvement in relations to China or to Russia. But at the same time, I think what can happen, actually, the most crucial point is Probably, you know, I think we, on one hand, we can see the continuation of the current developments of the current political processes in Czechia. Uh, yeah, how the politi political system works. On the other hand, I think there is a chance that we are going to change these processes in the way that it will be, um, I, uh, I would say more or better, politically communicated, uh, the processes will be more transparent, you know, the check and balances would be improved, uh, the political pluralism uh, is, would be improved, you know, the uh, independence of media uh, and, and so on, you know, this would be more transparent, more on democratic basis, more in line with the so-called liberal democracy. Yeah, I think this is something maybe we could, should also take into account. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll be definitely watching the results of Czech elections um, this weekend. Um, as we discussed today, uh, they are still an open race. Everything can happen. 
in some respects, it will be a turning point for the Czech Republic. And um, the stance of President Zeman, but also of small parties can, can very much determine uh, what the future government will look like. So thank you very much for this interesting discussion. I would like once again to thank the Aneta Zahova, Petru Just, and Daniel Martinek for an excellent elaboration of the pre-election situation and also um, on some past um, election scenarios. Many thanks also to our audience for uh, watching this discussion and also for participating actively for asking uh, questions. And last but not least, I would also like to thank our cooperation partners, the Karl Renner Institute and the Political Academy of uh, Austrian People's Party. The recording of uh, this discussion will also be soon available on the YouTube channel of IDM. And if you would like to read uh, the briefing uh, that Daniel presented at the very beginning, it is also available at the IDM website, www.idm.org. AT. Um, thank you very much once again, and see you at our next electoral discussion. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to discuss with you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.